I think you cross the line when, as the world reserve currency, you confiscate assets of another country. That's not for us to decide. And you could argue the, 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 the provocation is more on our side by weaponizing and stealing the assets of the Russians, by, by speaking of bringing NATO troops onto the front line now, you're hearing r rumors of that, by putting you know, NATO troops in the Ukraine, by, by talking with Finland and Sweden about joining NATO. We are provoking by providing weaponry, by providing money, by, by providing um, you know, intelligence. You could argue we're, we're, we're certainly provoking. I think the world looks at us as being completely hypocritical, you know, and 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 I think there's no better way to describe that than to see what's happened, for example, in, in Iraq, where we invent, invaded their country 20 years ago, and we're still there. We went there under the guise of weapons of mass destruction. Hey, sorry, we didn't find them. But here we are 20 years later, we're still here. We've sanctioned 14 of their banks for having the audacity of trying to buy liquid natural gas through Iranian banks. Um, and they made $90 billion in oil revenue last year, and they asked us for a billion dollars towards the end of last year, and we said, sorry, it's not a good time, check back later. So what have they done? They formally applied to BRICS. They've kicked, they're in the process of kicking Western coalition forces out of the country. They've made trading in dollars illegal. You'll go to prison if you do, and, and they'll take your business if you have a business. Um, and as of January 1st, there are no green bills in any denomination in any of the banks in Iraq. Or Janet Yellen can say that to CNBC last week or two weeks ago, listen, we're okay, China, with you being friends with Russia. And my initial reaction hearing that was, well, thank you so much, Madam Secretary. That's wonderful of you. But if you give one penny to the Russian war machine, we will sanction your, your banks, your businesses, and Beijing itself. Never mind that we've given $200 billion with little, if none, no congressional oversight to the Ukraine. We're the world reserve currency. We can do these things. The, the poking... The, the the prodding um it, it's i think it's it's ridiculous and and going around and pointing fingers uh i think is ridiculous i think much of the southern hemisphere and a good portion of the world looks at us as being the ones that are meddling and being involved and doing things that we shouldn't be doing so i you know what look i'm a patriot this country has done a lot for me but i think and i thank god every day i was born here but I think our leaders are, are, are embarking upon a disastrous course, one that is, you know, unfortunately leading towards perhaps World War III. And when you talk about bringing American soldiers, uh, and if you look, you know, they're talking about what would happen if, if Russia were to be more aggressive in an invasion towards Europe, you know, because we, they told us, you put, you put uh, NATO in these countries surrounding me, there's going to be problems. Now they're talking about a NATO you know, invasion force and where they would land and, and largely American troops. I mean, we're, we're out, of, they're out of our mind. We're telling them they can use American made military uh, weaponry to fire into Russia now. I mean, at what point does it just seem that we're not involved? This is a proxy war. And I think it's very hypocritical to cast stones at Putin um, because quite frankly, um, you know, it, it, it just seems to me that it's, there's a lot of blame to go around. 36 have formally applied. Now, you know, there's a lot of information out there and it's hard to, to discern which is the right one, but there's been 36 that have formally applied, seven that are really on the cusp. We'll see how many that they they bring into the fold, but yeah, it, it's a growing group for sure. I mean, they have the largest untapped oil reserves in the world, um, and I think they will. Uh, these are these countries are, are choosing sides, and I think that, that you will see countries like Venezuela uh, join BRICS. Turkey just admitted that they want to to join BRICS. Turkey's a NATO member. And when and they're talking about using Turkey to to have a, as a as a jump off point for if they had to get involved in the war where they would actually use Turkey as, as their airstrips and whatnot. Now they want to join the BRICS. What does all of this really mean? Um, look, I think if you look at the, the what's happening with the BRICS, it's legitimate and it's hard to delegitimize it. You already have a larger swath of, of human population, a larger percentage of global GDP, two of the three largest nuclear arsenals on the planet, more a larger swath of, of, of rare earth metals in the Eurasian continent and gold and silver and all of these commodities that, that are uh, part of what you would need to build a real economy and, and not opaque debt promises from an insolvent government 
Uh, and if you believe what Zoltan Pozar said, look at all the countries that they bring into the fold. These are countries that are massively resource rich and or have very strategic shipping lanes. And, you know, I think this is a trend that will only continue. You add into it the Belt Road Initiative, which is, we've talked about before, the largest infrastructure project in human history, which is many of the same countries, including all of the OPEC countries, and you start to get into 85 to 90 percent of human population, add into it the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the Eurasian Economic Union. I've been saying for years that they will join. Uh, Jim Rickards has said that. And now you got the president of Belarus calling for a summit to bring these two com these two organizations into the BRICS. You know, the, the SCO, who Saudi Arabia joined as well, so did Iran, is the largest regional financial and military organization on the planet. These 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 countries are finding safety in numbers. And I think it's just beginning. And that's the thing about the BRICS is that they've done things very methodically. People think this is something that just happened. They're going on 18 years that this has been going on, but it, the, the acceleration, their coordination, their sophistication is growing, accelerating. And um, I guess we'll see how it all plays out in the big meeting in October. But, um, you know, I, I think that this is something not to take lightly by any stretch of the imagination. We're seeing some very interesting things as well, um, you know, in terms of the exchanges being bled down. And, and you look at, for example, what's happening right now off of Comex. Just recently, three Fridays ago, we saw 7,560 kilo bars shipped out of, of the Comex to Brinks, Hong Kong. Brinks, Hong Kong is a Comex depository. And the conventional wisdom is that nothing goes to Brinks, Hong Kong that isn't what's called exchange for physical, where, you know, these, these traders can buy in the West and deliver in the East. Now China is paying a offering a very nice arbitrage opportunity for the traders who have the ability to access both markets. It's about four bucks an ounce in silver, not so acute in gold, but ask yourself this question, who the hell's got $571 million to purchase uh, 243,000 ounces delivered off of Comex to Brinks Hong Kong? And the, and the belief is, is that they are then trucked over because these are all kilo bars. And, and the Shanghai exchange deals in kilo bars. The mini contract on COMEX is kilo bars. So someone, some entity, and some people think it's HSBC Bank, I don't know who it is, but I can tell you that $571 million worth of kilo bars were delivered to Brinks Hong Kong. Some people believe it's then being trucked to the Shanghai exchange, which uses kilo bars. And when you talk about the amount of, of central bank purchasing, it's off the charts. Um, and I don't think we're even being told how much these central banks are buying. But when you realize that not only are these banks accumulating gold, it is a trend of repatriation as well. And, you know, the, re the Bank of India just moved 100 tons of gold quietly out of the Bank of England and took possession of it. And, and you go back a few years, you start with the Bundesbank in Germany, the Dutch National Bank. Uh, the, the Bank of Austria, Hungary, Turkey, Poland, we just saw the Bank of Saudi Arabia, all uh, several um, African banks and a couple more Middle Eastern banks all pull their gold out of the Bank of England and the New York Fed. So it's, a, it's, it's about slow repatriation, it's about slow accumulation, not too fast to raise attention. But what I really do believe is happening is that the Western suppression of metals, as foolish as it is, which has originally been there to to suppress the demand for gold in a low interest rate environment, which is obviously changing, um, they're using that suppression, uh, the, the large short positions of the commercial banks to drain the exchanges, to do exchange for physical, to drain the COMEX, to drain the LBMA, and now even pulling metal out of the Shanghai exchange, uh, because I think counterparty risk is something that is very acute. And the belief that you know, um, wealth is found in, in a broke country's debt, uh, our treasuries, or, or a country that has chosen to inflate versus uh, being prudent with, with their, their fiscal policy and the monetary policies. Uh, I think we are moving to a period of time where the rules are being changed, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It's like, it's almost as if gold and silver markets seem to be playing by a new set of rules, I guess is what I would try to say. And, um, it's almost as if commodities, like Zoltan Pozar said, this is Bretton Woods 3, a system surrounded by commodities. 
It's as if commodities are worth more than currency nowadays, and this is a rush to do so, but not so fast that it creates attention. And this is how they suppress the paper price and then deliver it. Take possession of $571 million with the kilo bars in China when no one's looking off of the COMEX. This is a trend that I think you will see accelerate. And, um, you know, it's, it's the central banks largely. The big money who has not just the big money, but it's closest to the information. And, and it's interesting to me that this is being overlooked. This transition of, of gold and silver from west to east is a phenomenon that's real. And I think it's, it's interesting to me just how under... Uh, the underestimation of the significance of this in the West to me is, sh is, is shocking. It doesn't make any sense, to be honest with you. Um, you know, who knows what our real gold reserves are? Who knows where the 12 billion in gold reserves that the Ukraine supposedly sold to fund the war went? Who knows where Saddam Hussein's gold went or Gaddafi's gold went? You know, I don't know. It's, it's, it's actually, I find it to be quite foolish um, that the Eastern countries are so open about their gold accumulation and you know but but it's not true how much they're accumulating you got analysts from the bank of montreal you got even people i think in the imf who came out and said the numbers that that we see are nowhere near what is actually being accumulated and you know china's the largest producer of gold in the world too they're not telling us how much they're producing we have no idea how much they're really truly accumulating but i think it's very foolish i think it's hubris i think it's recency bias, normalcy bias. Um, I think the West is, is um, if they really aren't accumulating any, they're asleep at the switch. This is a system where, look, if you look at a historical footprint, accepting treasury debt, the debt of another country has a very small footprint in terms of being historically significant. And I think we're moving away from that. And when you weaponize the treasury uh, and make it so that if we don't align ideologically, we're gonna take it from you, only as incentivizing and accelerating the detreasurization, the de-dollarization and the accumulation of gold, which has no counterparty risk. And this is the whole thing here. It's an asset, not only that has outperformed the bond market going back to 2000 handily, but it's an asset that carries, as Doug Casey has made famous his statement, an asset that simultaneously carries no counterparty liability. And it's true. And I think that's really what the world is realizing, that uh, if, as Rick Rule says, you're not a contrarian, you're destined to be a victim. And, and if you're fully invested in dollars, you're destined to go broke.